you very much uh ladies and gentlemen esteemed viewers of the civil space tv especially the community show web none of them and we thank you for always i'm um, watching the discussions i looked the other day on um the youtube channel and there's a couple of views and we are proud that we are we are being watched and our panelists are creating an impact out there in the communities. So for the seventh community show webinar, we are going to talk on a topic that is familiar. We've talked about education, we've talked about COVID-19, talked about lockdown and all these things. So what we do today is create a nexus between the three. We are merging them. So our topic is the inequalities in the education sector. Has COVID-19 made it worse? So our panel is made of distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, we have Mr. Nanda Chizito, who is a law student at the Mighty Makerere University. He joins us for this discussion today. We have our friend, uh, Okware Peter, a primary school teacher and educationist. Uh, he works with a couple of schools. Uh, making his maiden appearance, just like Nanda Chizito, I should have said, is Mr. Andrew Besige, uh, who is a policy, a public policy and communication uh, enthusiast, and he works with the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance. All the way from Chambogo University. In the capacity of a lecturer is uh, Irene Wandiku. And we're also joined by Edith, and that makes the panel of our discussion today. So here is the background of what we're discussing today. And this is known almost everyone that uh, lives in Uganda and has followed the news. Owing to the threat of COVID-19, sometime in March 2020, the government closed all public gatherings. That included churches, that included mosques, that included public transport, and that most importantly included schools, all levels of learning, from nursery up to the university. Those were closed. COVID-19 by its very nature spreads um, through the air and spreads most where people are. There's dense co uh, concentration of people. So the government's closure of schools was in regard to that, that they would deny the spread of COVID-19 a chance. So since then, we know that schools have been closed. They've been opened and closed, opened and closed. Andrew, I'm going to ask that you turn off your camera. Okay, thank you. So the schools have been closed and reopened, closed and reopened, but there has not been a congenital solution that has worked since now. When the government ordered the closure of schools, it advised that on online learning was um, the best avenue. So it advised parents and schools to work and liaison with each other to ensure that kids continued learning online. They also promised on their part to provide radios for every homestead that had school going, uh, school age going children. And they also promised that they would give TV sets to villages to enable uh, uh, co co um, congregated but manageable crowds of students to learn. These the government floated as safer options. However, we all know for a fact that today, this very day as I speak, most if not all children have not received either of these. The government also promised online, online learning material that it printed and distributed to a few people here and there. However, the negative impact of closure of schools have, has been felt by teachers, it has been felt by students and pupils, it has been felt by parents, it has been felt by communities, and there's a warning that it's going to be felt even more severely by the country as a whole. But depending on where you stand, socially and economically. The impact has been felt differently. There are those that have been hit the hardest, and these predominantly are those that are the most pressed members of our, our, our societies. So, as we, call, as we have this discussion today, these are the facts that we should bear in our mind. We know, for instance, that the poor man has had his kid raped, abused, um, impregnated, all these experts say that if these kids had stayed in school, this could have been prevented. We are not saying that schools shouldn't have been closed. We're just looking at this divide and how complicated it has become. We are, we are going to ask questions like if this should have been managed better. So there is fear even up to now that when, even when schools will open, very many people may not go back to these schools, especially kids coming from the other divide of the family, uh, I mean of the society, the ones that are, do not have the means the ones that have been staying home for all this while are not going to school. The ones that don't have data, the ones that don't have smartphones in the family to continue their learning. So here now we start with our questions. And I'm going to ask question one, our good friend Edith. 
it is um, just how unequal, just how divided, just how segregated was the education sector in Uganda in lines of rich versus poor or well-to-do versus the more humble families and homesteads in Uganda before, yeah, before COVID-19 disrupted things. Just how divided were we in the education? Thank you very much, our moderator. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, CCG, for having me again. Uh, the education sector has always been divided. Uh, we have had, um, um, we've we've always had the rich, the rich kids go to the rich to the rich schools, and of course the poor, eh, the grassroots people, always their children always end up, always end up in government, uh, you know, not even government aided, but government owned schools that are really badly off in seed schools that actually are not well facilitated. So uh, when it comes to even what is happening now during the pandemic, it is not a shock at all. This is what we expect. This is what is expected. And, uh, you know, it is worse for the poor, for the poor students, for the poor pupils, because that, they had, well, this is what happened before the pandemic. They were able to access, maybe some teachers would report to school and maybe they were able to learn something. They were able to maybe access some textbooks from schools, that is if those schools had. But when you look at private schools, uh, they try to endeavor. Even when the, the, the private school is starting, the, 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 the directors try to do anything to make sure they provide for their learners, which is not the case when it comes to very poor schools. So, and now when it comes to the pandemic, it even gets worse, it even gets worse. So if, but it is not a shock for me as a teacher, it's not a shock for me that rural schools, especially students are even unable to access any online education. Uh, whereas the schools like uh, Uganda Matters, you know, the big schools in the country, they are, their learners are still are able to access teachers. They are able to access learning, you know, learning products. They are able to access online Number one, their, their parents can afford internet, they can afford e-learning, they can afford to buy them books, uh, they can afford to, to, to buy them any learning materials that are needed or required, uh, you know, to study. But when it comes to poor students, I want us to imagine, dear panelists, fellow panelists, this is a child of maybe someone who is a compound cleaner in a certain organization. This is a child of someone, maybe a cook in a very small school. This is a child of a peasant, a textbook, the cheapest textbook in Uganda, you can get it at 10,000. This is someone earning like 40,000 as salary at, uh, for a month. Uh, the, 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 the lowest price of a smartphone is 100,000 or an item at 80,000. That is money that can feed a certain family for about two months and, and plus. So really, we all know that the education sector in Uganda has always been divided. So how can these people afford, if they were not even able to afford packing food, eh? packing food for the students as they go and pupils as they go to school, if they cannot afford to buy like sanitary towels for the girls and girls are using dirty rugs, they are using the uh, pieces of clothes, if they cannot afford, if they are not even able to, you know, to afford school shoes, when you go to rural areas in Nakapiripiliti, in Karamoja, if you go to Western Uganda, in Kabale, we've seen stories of, of parents even, I don't know, we've seen all this. So I don't think this should even be a shock to us that it only learning is happening in with the richer, or the richer class of people and then the poor, the poor people are still just like, and we should expect it if, if their children don't get back to school. Because I, I, I know personally so many girls that have been taken to the city to find a job so that they can earn a salary that can help homes. I know so many girls that have dropped out of school and now are, are probably uh, house, housekeepers of certain of, of rich families. So this shouldn't be a shock to us. I think we should all think about how can we stop this cycle and how can it end. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Edith. <coughs> um, I will now ask uh, um, Irene, I think Irene has joined us. Irene, is education such an expensive commodity in Uganda? So just looking at what Edith has said, have we made education such, I mean, quality education? Because there can be the cheap education, but she seems to suggest that this is really um, um, about the quality of the education. So have you made good quality education so expensive and so costly that the poor man cannot afford it anymore? Thank you so much, our moderator. Good morning, everyone. Glad to be here again. We thank CCG and all the program moderators. Uh, Edith has given us a very good background of how education is in Uganda, how it was and how it is. When we, we look at education, um, both from rural setting and urban settings, it seems we are not in the same country. Education has been very expensive, much as we, we have UPEs, much as we have um, USEs, it's not for free. And that small, which, which looks small to other people, there are so many children who have failed to even join UP schools just because of charges like 15,000 per term, um, 30,000 per term. Uh, these schools, what they tell us is some of this money, small, small money in government schools are used for uh, motivating teachers, which is key. However, there are those families that cannot afford that money. That has always been there. Now, here comes COVID-19. COVID-19 has made every education inaccessible and the, 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 the various strategies that the government has put, things like online studies, you know, children, many children, majority are not going to access education. Hence, education is very, very expensive for people. Things like even the online materials, people cannot download them. Most of our children, village settings and their parents, they don't know about those things. They can't even download those materials, even if they download. Assuming a parent has never gone to school and you have this document in the house and the parent cannot guide the child, do you think the child can read that document on his or her own and even um, uh, understand and go back to school and say that I have learned? And if we rely on these online studies, some children are going to lag behind. They are not going to uh, go in the pace of others. In urban settings, others are those who can afford, they are, children are having smartphones, children are accessing, they can buy data for these children, but in rural settings or in other families, even in urban settings, there are some families which are not okay. They can't afford all this. Villages do not have internet to access all this, even if you have smartphone, there are some places in Uganda where you, if you reach, you can't even access the network or not come, you can't call. So education in Uganda has become very, very expensive, so expensive that many children are not going to learn, according to my own observation. They are not going to learn. I interacted um, after our meeting the other time, and I interacted with a few children. Some told me, I've already got a job. I'm, going, I'm, I'm, I'm getting something every day. Must I go back to school to do what? I'm thinking of marriage. So, so many things have gone on. Education has become very expensive in Uganda, so expensive that we are worried if, if most of our children will study up to the end. Thank you. I submit. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that submission. I'm going to ask the admin to make Nanda a speaker uh, or a panelist. I see he's, in the, he's among the attendants. Okay, as um, admin does that, uh, I will reserve Nanda's question and first move to Peter. Peter, you are a teacher, you teach in a primary school. In fact, you teach in a couple of them and you work with a couple of them. I just want to get it from you. For all the time you've been teaching, how, how is this divide in education behaving? Is it getting worse? I mean, we are still talking pre, uh, before COVID, pre-COVID. Is it gets, getting worse? Are there some positive steps the government has taken that have made it a little bit better? Maybe not, not where we should be, but we are getting there. So when you look at it, how, how, how do you analyze it um, from your own perspective as, as a teacher that works with all these schools? 
Mr. Okware, we can't seem to hear you. I don't know if you're trying to speak. I don't know if you're trying to speak. Sorry, technology and the online. Are you saying if if the online technology is challenging the teacher? What about the learners? <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I now see why. That's, uh, that's the right gesture of how the reality is on ground. Because okay. I always use this technology daily, but at times I do forget. So uh, thank you, Godwin, for this salient question and uh, the organizers and our TVs, Civic Space TV, for this opportunity. Uh, first and foremost, you have talked about uh, like where the where 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 as the situation the covid where has it placed us but before answering that let me first uh talk about something brief that you talked about on the quality the quality of the education uh during this time uh one of the major things that that has totally failed us as a nation is a provision of quality education we have greatly attached quality to 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 to, to cost the more quality it becomes is the more cost uh being attached like you find that our education is becoming very expensive good quality education and this is it quality education should be a human right it shouldn't be a privilege but i don't know why people are behaving in that way whereby if a person is comfortable they can take their children to the first class schools and they don't mind about others and you find so many people they get money instead of at least starting up schools in their communities, they construct bars, they construct lodges, they construct uh, recreational centers, and at the end of the day, they are the same people blaming the government. So if it isn't a collective responsibility, it simply means this generation is going to blame, we are going to blame the coming, and all of us, at least we shall go like that. Then coming on this point of uh, the exposure, as this pandemic exposed us, has it made us better? Has it, uh, at least, what are the impact and the the the, the, the impact and the repercussions, uh, mainly in the education sector? I will just talk about one thing. It's simply the exposure. It has totally exposed and showed how unprepared and how weak we are. Not as a government, no, but all of us. Why? Uh, it has totally showed us that no one knows their role. Parents don't know their role. Schools don't know their role, uh, teachers don't know their role, and even the government doesn't know its role. The government has taken up the role of being the major stakeholder, but it's not being the stakeholder now, it has become the stake owner of education. But that's not the right thing. Everyone should be a stake owner because education at the end of the day is not benefiting individuals, neither stakes, uh, different uh, ministries. Education is it's supposed to benefit all of us, and uh, the, the final beneficiary should be the learner. Now, it has totally exposed us. And uh, if you go on uh, and look at the way how people are grappling, they put a lot of money. But me, I made my personal research and I called over 100 head teachers, from, not, in, from, not, not from Kampala, because from Kampala, those ones, I do meet them. But 100 head teachers from outside Kampala, the person could tell you I've never received even any learning material. Yet I hear they say that they put billions, how many billions, but you, are, you ask yourself, where did the material go? So it has totally exposed our, us as a nation. It has also totally exposed the parents that we don't know our role as parents. Yesterday I was asking a parent, I, I think I would also pose this to our parents here on the platform. Uh, what is career guidance? And what is your role as a parent? Is it your role just to pay school fees? And uh, at the end of the day, there are so many things that we should agree upon as teachers, schools, and the stakeholders. What are the objectives of the real education that children go to achieve from school? So this was the right time for all of us to sit and redesign, re-strategize, remobilize, and rethink about the, the quality education we need. Should, do we need the education of the results to come back after COVID? Or we need the, the at least the improved education of solution best? Personally, it might not be uh, a common answer, but as an individual, based on my experience and my, my finding, I believe that currently in Uganda, we just need solution-based education. And solution-based education, it can work best if the Ministry of Education and all the stakeholders engage parents. They, don't, they shouldn't only make their own decision. Like, this is the right time when the Ministry would have highly involved all the parents in the learning process. They haven't. This is the right time when the ministry would highly engage the media in the learning process. They haven't. 
Now, currently, everyone, when the schools go back to normal, we are going to go back in the, the rat cage, the rat cage, the normal race. So I think it has totally, in a nutshell, it has totally exposed how unwilling, by the way, unwilling we are to see that we change the nation, how unprepared we are, and how selfish everyone is. Because if a person has money, they know that they will take their child to study in Cambridge, and they don't, they won't mind about others. So it has totally showed us how ungodly we are. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Okwari, um, for that wonderful submission. You're one of the people that interact most with that sector, especially at the lower level. What we, we take for granted, whatever you say. Now, let's move to someone that is actually in the sector as a student and as, as a learner, Mr. Nanda Chizito. Um, Nanda, uh, everybody so far has talked of the divide in the education sector. And uh, what they, they, they've even hinted on some of the impacts. Now, I want to get it from you, uh, from a student, from the horse's mouth. How does the wide divide um, in the education sector affect the quality of education um, received by less fortunate? members of the community, and how does that then affect their contribution to society? Over to you, Nanda. Looks like we've lost Nanda. So as we wait for him to, 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 to get back, I'm going to ask um, Andrew. Uh, Andrew, are you with us? Yes, I am. Oh, awesome. So um, I, want, I want you, you know, you work with the I government. I am, I am. Yeah, you work with the government of Uganda. Uh, we have kids that in this country that go to private schools, private nursery schools, that are paying millions of shillings in tuition. And then you have it for a fact that government, um, last time I checked the figures, we are about 40,000 per head uh, for students, uh, for people in UPE schools. And that is annual, that should cater for salary, salary of teachers, that should cater for chalk, that should cater for their books and everything. When you see this, contribution on the part of government for UP, and you contrast that with nursery uh, school children who are paying millions of shillings in this country. What does this divide show, show you as someone that um, works for government? You get worried like the rest of us. You think the government should act upon it and all that. Um, thank you, Godwin. Um, good morning to everybody. Um, with those that think the government has abandoned the education sector. We have something called the National Development Plan, and in that National Development Plan, education is key. Um, yes, the cost of education has gone high, um, but we must realize, first of all, we must understand our history. Um, remember, our education sector was uh, destroyed by the political turbulence that we suffered from 1966 up to 1986. Up to 1986, it's only in the 1990s that government um, allowed in private players so that it, it could direct uh, investors. So that, um, so that all those that really needed it. Um, of course, private players, actually capitalists, they, they are profit driven. And in, in today's Uganda, they have, they have helped distort our sector. Um, however, Ministry of Education and, 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 and Government of Uganda for that matter, for that matter um, have come up with policies and programs and that are trying to curtail the runaway costs of education. Um, in the latest um, national priorities for education, aside from providing USC and UPE and sensitizing the population about UPE and USC, uh, there's also improvement of us to make sure that Uganda are at the same level. So if you're a teacher in good dog, your quality should be the same as that of a teacher in Makovore. If you're a teacher in, in, in Ndeje Primary School, your quality should be the same as that of a teacher in Lohana Academy. So these, these are all programs geared towards improving uh, the quality of the teachers. Now, when you improve the quality of the teachers, ultimately, it means you're making the teacher central within the education system, all right? 
So when you make the teacher central within the education, it means that standard. If, if a teacher in a rural school has the same commitment, the same training as a teacher in an urban school, then it, no matter how, because these teachers are always rotated, it means that however way you rotate them, the, the impact they will have on the student will be the same and therefore the standards will improve. So it is my belief that our education system is actually under ascendancy. It is my belief that um, despite the interruption caused by COVID, it's my belief that our education system will ultimately triumph. Thank you. Uh, thank you, my brother, Andrew, for that submission. I see that Nan has really had a lot of problems with um, 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 this connectivity. Like Okware said, I imagine if this was an online lecture uh, where Nanda had to attend as a student, um, we are getting a practical feel of what he must be going through out there. So I'm going to ask for the final time that the admin um, makes him a speaker. Um, I see his video is on. I see he is now on. Nanda, are you there? Mr. Chisito Nanda. Just, just unmute your microphone. I see it's still muted. Nanda? OK, we, 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 we surely can always get back to Nanda. Um, I'll, I'll pack his question and then proceed with the discussion. Uh, Peter, you've, you, you, you've, you've said, like everyone else has said, that there's a huge divide in the education sector. Andrew has said that the government is actually working hard to ensure that. Nanda, are you back? Nanda? OK, let's first proceed. We shall, we shall get back to that. So uh, like I said, um, Peter, we, 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 we've, we've ha you've said there is a huge divide, a very costly divide. And everyone seems to agree, except for Andrew. Andrew does acknowledge that there's a problem, but he says that um, progressively, we are working to make the problem less complicated. And he's very optimistic that um, in the near future, things are going to get much better. So um, you being the person that has worked with a couple of these schools, you've seen it, you've been in the field. I want you to paint for us a picture especially of the rural schools you work with and of the rural schools from which you hear or you've visited, how adaptive have they been um, to the idea of online learning? How receptive, first of all, have they, have they received it? Is it something that they are, uh, is going on well for them? Is it something that we can, um, at the end of COVID, look back and say, yes, because uh, student X in China Mukaka was learning online, they are fit, they deserve to be promoted from P2 to P3 because they've done exactly what the P2 students should have done within that time. So um, I want to hear from you, Peter, in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Godwin. Uh, firstly, I appreciate Andrew for his submission. And uh, at least uh, to, to Andrew, one thing that at least if we are to go ahead as a nation, that we should stop. And we should stop it if at least we are the lovers of Africa and the lovers of Uganda. We should stop that. Uh, narrative. We should totally stop it and do away with it. Of always saying, now you see, we were in the turbulence in the 18th, in the 19th, up to, we have had over 30 years. 30 years whereby we reached a time, and I think we might not be, uh, we might be in the same age bracket, but there are times when all the East African countries, their students used to come to Uganda for studies. Ask yourself a question, why are the numbers dropped? So we should uh, we shouldn't go on that uh, excuse of saying that you see we are in a turbulence now we are we are just re recovering no 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 thirty years is more than enough then uh, by the way I'm not political yeah then the other thing uh, Andrew talked about the issue of improving the teachers I would like at least to before answering Godwin it's better to be systematic you know that at least to clean ourselves and uh, make everything quite better and ask yourself a simple question how many teachers. How many teachers uh, or how many students from the from police implementers and the ministers 
the, the children of the ministers, how many of them do attend public schools? How many of them do study in Uganda? So at the end of the day, we should stop the, 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 the council of pretense. Eh? Uh, the, we cannot make things better if, if you are not eating that food. You can never make it better. Until when everyone becomes part and parcel of the education uh, approach and system, whereby it should be a mandate that even a child of a minister should study in a public school. Their public schools will get at least the right grip. But if it is not like that, we are just deceiving ourselves. I've been in all the train, most of the training colleges because I do train teachers. But the situation is totally very, very uh, appealing because I remember one time we went to enable teachers. Now, Godwin, I'm answering. One time we went in 2017, we volunteered as teachers in need to go and support one of the training colleges, which I may not. Okay, let me mention it. Gaba Teachers Call Training Center. To enable them college, to enable them get email addresses. But the truth is, it was voluntary, everything was funded by teachers in need. But we reached there when so many teachers had uh, smartphones by that time. But out of the 300 plus teachers that we, we, we worked on, because of that, on that day we enabled over 270 get email addresses. Over, like, over just 20 had email addresses. And it was like only 10 that active email addresses. So if that basic technology has not been embraced, you find that whatever is being embraced by all the PTCs, it has to be highly funded by the whites. Whenever their funding ends, even the life goes down. So we have a very big challenge whereby we, 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 we jump on things. We don't, in Uganda, we don't, we don't, firstly, we don't like the truth. We, we hate systems and we don't want to, to do things gradually. In fact, this we wanted to embrace this um, uh, e-learning mainly in the, in, the, in the rural areas. We should first make a, a, a needs assessment, find out are the teachers in the rural areas, are they well acquainted with the information that can enable them uh, learn uh, or enable their learners get the, 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 the knowledge, and if they do, do the parents have the, the needed gadgets? The truth is, in all the, the rural schools, because at least we have been in all the, 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 all the regions of the nation, but honestly speaking, uh, it is very hard to find even families whereby they have a gadget, just a mere radio, that will enable their children learn. And with the learning of radio, it is just one type of learning, it is auditory learning the learning of audio, and it has so many challenges. So if even families don't have radios, now how do you expect a family to have data? How do you expect them to have smartphones? And besides that, if really our government was saying that they are bringing this in good spirit, in a good spirit, they would at least have tried to do it by removing all the charges for this time on education in terms of the data. And they would have, made, they would have put at least a free portal which would have enabled any person to access any educational material online without paying a single cent. But if they are just making bundles expensive, for us at least when we are trying to, to teach children and uh, to teach teachers and parents via uh, online. But people are complaining. People are complaining about their data. So what about the person in the village who doesn't have it? So I believe it's just we 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 are just um, we are just pretending, but we are not really uh, at least doing the right thing. The right thing would be for for all the stakeholders to first ap appreciate that yes, we have COVID, and uh, look at ways on how we can come up with easy formalities on how to reopen maybe schools and uh, how to if we are to use ICT, how to first equip all teachers with the knowledge, with the gadgets, and make a, a, a survey that. Do all the parents have what it takes to provide home or, or home school homeschooling uh, online learning in their homes? If not that, I do believe maybe we would like we are just doing it for the privileged few in the name of Uganda. Thank you. Edith, before I bring in Andrew, I want to listen in from you as well. Um, Edith, I'm speaking to you. I am I'm sure you've heard that what Okwari has just said. That the, the fact that we don't have the rich man's kid, the rich man in government, um, the minister, the PS, and all these leaders, the fact that we don't have their children going to these very schools in the communities, um, the, the, the Navy primary school or Soroti primary school, those UPE schools, and instead they opt to take their kids 
in either the best of the private schools we have, or even in some cases abroad, is part of the problem. Do you agree that, um, do you have a similar view that a part of our education problem is that those who should regulate the sector, who should ensure that it is of a certain standard, are not even consumers of our education? I mean, at least their children are not. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Um, let us think about it. If it were you, you have a good paying job. I mean, you're looking at ministers. Don't just look at ministers, also other people, other civilians, Ugandans who have their money. Would you take your child, uh, Godwin, would you take your child to a terrible school all because you, you, you have that, I don't know, you have that empathy and sympathy for the community? This, let us not shift the blame. If I am a minister and I see I cannot like take a child, let some a minister, maybe I come from Toroko and there is in Toroko primary school. I cannot, I cannot take my child to Toroko primary school when I can afford, when I can afford to take my child to let's say um, Taiba junior school. Uh, it, it, I, do, I wouldn't understand it really, but the whole thing gets back to, to the Ministry of Education, to the government of Uganda. And they have done great because when you look in the 1980s, Uganda did, you know, such kids were not able to go to school. They fought a battle that they would actually, like they fought a battle to make sure that Ugandan children can go to school by creating UP schools. But the only it only comes to their funding, you know. It only comes to, 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 when it comes to their funding, when it comes to their support, that such rural schools should be supported. Even if the school fees are not so much, so the schools, like the school, the school stakeholders cannot do a lot. That's when the government comes in here, Godwin. Look, there are organizations that have stepped in, enable such kids in ECD come in to, to, to help with school, with pupils to get some work. What, what is the role up with big organizations like Rotary International? They can partner up with USAID, but, and you know, do this. It all comes to, do the stakeholders of this country, do they have a heart for the, for the grassroots individual? Indeed, when you say they don't care, you're absolutely right, because their children are to good schools that were then the Namagungas and what. So it is highly, I, I would highly add, those rural schools do not need a lot. Right now, curriculum development center, and you know, there are so many teachers I do. Give them a project, let them print out, let them, you know, you know, put work together for these children in rural settings so that they can access. And the government has failed here. This was its time to be very selfish. This was its time to use all its funding to make sure that when they talk about televisions and radios, it was not important. Just make printout materials and, and make sure that every rural school gets and endeavor that every, you know, send them to the district education officer and the district education officer makes sure that all head teachers get that mat learning material. That learning material Eh? That learning material can, and then the head teachers will also make sure teachers supply them, parents come to schools and get them. I'll give an example of our school. Students during the first lockdown, they came from wherever. They used to foot even around 15 to 20 kilometers to come and get learning material that was availed then that was there, if the government had done the same. This would, you know, even if I come from, I'm a little child, even when I'm coming from a garden at home, I would remember that I have some homework to do. And this would keep them very, very active. So the fact that these people, they don't think there is an empathy. They do not understand that these people actually, for the country to even be better, they, we all need to, all these people deserve education and they deserve to do better. And they deserve to also have the same information like their children are able to access. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Edith. Uh, Nanda says he's now back and he promises that uh, there will be no interruptions whatsoever. And I can only hope so. But before I get to Nanda, let me, let me, let me ask Andrew. Andrew, Mr. Quarry and uh, I mean, yeah, Mr. Quarry and Edith, each seem to suggest that because we have um, 
ministers' kids, the kids of the PSC in these ministries, and whoever is concerned with education on the part of government, having their kids studying in the best possible schools around in Uganda, <laughs> or in the in, in the extreme cases, even taking their kids abroad to study, so they don't they don't affect the what happens in the Ugandan schools. They suggest that that possibly is the problem. That, like the Jamaicans say, he who feels it knows. That if you're not you're not feeling this, you can never be part of it. You can never get concerned. Do you think the divide being caused by COVID? That some children are learning, some children in the village being abused and being made pregnant. Do you think it's because of the fact that the, the, the high people, as far as the education and the government is concerned? are insulated from these problems. Do you agree with that view? Thank you very much. No, I do not agree with that view. And uh, with all respects to Mr. Okwari, I think he's wrong and he misunderstands me. You cannot hope to progress as a country if you do not know the effect of your history on your present. So when he says that we stop giving excuses, it's a reality. Are now peaceful. And so they, they, there's no need to come to Uganda. And, you know, high and all in privileged private schools in Uganda. I don't think that's a big issue. Uh, looks like we've lost Andrew. Um, I'm sure he's going to join us uh, at the earliest instance. Now, I want to ask Nanda. Nanda, I have several questions for you, but uh, I'm going to first ask you this. Purely speaking as a student, um, nothing else. How does the divide in the education sector affect learning of children from the less fortunate backgrounds in this country called Uganda? So when you look at Makere, um, the, the much the, the well-to-do children and the, the ones that are not so well-to-do, do they get, are they enabled the same access the education that is offered at Makere? And then to, um, um, to use it also, Godwin, same, or there is a difference. Godwin, can I just complete my submission? Oh, sure. Thank you. You can complete your submission. All right. Thank you. Um, I, I was saying on the issue of, of, uh, of ministers and public servants and, you know, having their children study in primary schools that are privileged or secondary schools or universities that are... I, I do not think that is a problem. Um, one, one takes their child where they want their child to go. Um, and... In, and in, and, and rich people usually have their children study courses that might not necessarily be availed in, in Ugandan universities, things like ethno, ethnomusicology. So if you're a child of a, of, a, of a PM and they take you to a British university to study that, I do not think that is a problem. Uh, however, also saying that, um, as Edith was saying, that these, because these people take their children abroad or in, in privileged private schools that they do, system is struggling to transition from the missionary and colonial education style uh, that was their modern 21st century style. Um, when we talk about things like e-learning, um, I think it is imperative and, and I believe that the education is taking this seriously, that number one, you train the teachers on how to use e-learning gadgets and, and things like that. But most critically, that you extend the infrastructure uh, of, of, of internet throughout the whole country, urban and rural areas, which is being done at the moment. Um, I've come in and, and started uh, the progress of these things because 
but other things is being done. So I do not agree that there's no care for rural education. There's USC school. I speak good in me being a product of rural school. I do not think has disadvantaged me in any way. Um, thirdly, I think as parents, we also have roles to play. Um, we keep talking about the rural poor, rural poor, rural poor, and yet statistics show that rural, rural poor give to birth to more children <laughs> than those who are in urban areas. But as parents, we begin to take responsibility for the children we give birth to. You cannot be a person earning 40,000 shillings a month and you're giving birth every nine months, you know? So when we're blaming government, we must reach a point where we also have to look at ourselves as individuals and ask, what have I done? to exacerbate this problem or to solve this problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, so I'm going to go to Nanda before we lose him. Nanda, I had asked you the question, I had laid it out. So um, when you look at the university where you are located, does the status, the social being of children from these various backgrounds, does it affect um, their learning and um, what we can expect out of them as a country at the end of it all? And finally, does COVID make that even worse? Can you hear me, Godwin? Yes, I can. Oh, thank God. I've been off for most of the discussion, so I'm sorry if there are things I've missed and may, may repeat or something. But to go to your question, it's true so many students in Makere are not at the same footing with fellow learners because of these inequalities. And I don't know if other speakers have made this submission, but when you look at the ratio of how many Ugandan children join education in primary and those that graduate, it's really low. I've been looking at statistics and about 65% of students who join school don't complete university. So if we have graduates that are 30,000 every year from millions that join primary, it shows that really there is a, a huge gap of students that don't make it through. So for Makere specifically, as you've asked, we see it that in terms of lectures, for example, if you say, if you say let's have online lectures, the assumption is that most students can afford data and can attend Zoom, which costs really some good amount of data, but that's not true. That's why you see that every Time there is a chance of university opening, maybe for medical students, and there is a, a gap for, for lectures to go on. Students that are not medical students, or even those that are not finalists, flock back to campus to access Wi Fi. And you may think it's, you may think, well, if you can afford to go to campus, it means you will have to feed, it means you will have to do this and that. So why don't you use that money for that and stay home? But that's that ignores the fact that students sacrifice at times food and say, let me go to campus, I will drink water and attend lectures. This is quite unfair, even in terms of mental health. When you have these inequalities, a child that has less or nothing and can only afford to listen in in two lectures and cannot have something to eat after the lecture, like university has students from all across the board, students from different backgrounds. And to struggle to compete with someone who is well to do and you have less when you're barely surviving through campus, it becomes so hard for you to, to, to cope up academically. So in the end, you, you will say, well, students are not performing well, this and that, but government is really abandoning, subsidizing education for them so that we create some inequality because it's very hard for a state to control inequality outside of school. You're not going to take away Rajiv Ruparelia's money and give it to me while trying to chew inequality. So the least you can do is that if Rajiv can afford some kind of education at campus, government should also try to bridge that gap for us to try to bridge that inequality. So that at least when we have the same qualification, we can compete each to advance our dreams and try to create some equity in this society after graduation. Back to you, Godwin. 
Okay, thank you. So um, I had you say something that suggests this, but this was your second question. So I want you to clear the air and make it categorically clear. Um, according to your own assessment and your own usage and the experience you've had with your friends, do you think online learning at the university has been successful or it has been a huge failure? I mean, would you employ someone that has gone through that system of online learning over someone that has gone through the system that we had before COVID-19? <laughs> Godwin, I'll speak for Makerere. I cannot speak for other universities because I'm ignorant of them, but I will tell you for sure, it has not worked. Please, please switch off that. It has not worked. The thing with Makere is this, because even, even if it were not for online lectures, I think Makere students have the agency to push themselves and learn. I think that's what qualifies them somehow beyond other institutions. And that's why it's called one of the leading research institutions in the country. So you'll find that students struggle to buy notes and read and go to the library and do this and that, and try to bridge the gap of the lectures they missed. I've been in classes where you, for example, you have, uh, you have about 70 students doing banking, but on average, a lecturer is teaching and she has 15, 20, 30, so more than half of the students are not attending. And those in attendance, attend for five minutes, are off, join back, are off. So it's really unfair to them. It's really unfair to the vast majority of students who, can, who can't afford a stable internet, or even who can't afford internet at all. And even these presumptions we have that, well, students at campus have phones, students at campus have laptops. This is a, a huge lie. This is a huge lie. There are students that come at campus when they struggled from villages, got a government sponsorship, and all they left home with was their dreams and ambitions and came to campus. Uh, personally, I, I, got, I, I got my first phone in year two. So imagine I studied the whole of year one. I wasn't in any class group. I didn't know anything. So, but I don't consider myself even to be one of the most underprivileged students. So there are students who really struggle through, throughout. So it has not, uh, online learning has not had any impact. Students who have passed have passed because of cruder efforts that are not to do with using, using online learning. Godwin, back to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nanda. Thank you, you've, you've made you. I see in the chat room, it's almost exploding. Uh, Irene, Andrew, and Peter at each other's throat. We are going to get to you in a minute. But let us ask um, Irene before, before we proceed. Uh, Irene, you, you, you've argued passionately that the government, uh, under the current circumstances, it has not done much to support um, online learning, and um, this is a white elephant, something that you can't put in the phone in the very first place. I want to understand from you, do you think this could have been done much better? Do you think if the government, for instance, had prepared the teacher, I'm talking at the university level specifically, if the government, the student at the university, you can use online learning. Do you think there was need for the government, first of all, prepare the students, get them educated and acquainted with these things and then introduce it, um, which I, I know wasn't done. So could that be part of the problem? Over to you, Irene. Thank you, Mr. Toko. Yes, I think government could have done uh, better, especially the National, National Curriculum Development Center. For online to be effective, uh, one of the suggestions I want to make is this, that computer training should be included as a course unit in all the teachers' uh, courses, all the, at all levels, actually, we never knew that this online uh, learning is, was going to be very essential up to this extent, but this is what I suggest. I'm speaking this out of experience. Um, me, when I did my bachelor's, uh, computer training was one of the course units and compulsory for everyone. So when we are asked to do online training, it was very easy for me because I wasn't. But 
uh, when it comes to someone who has never touched a computer, the person will even fear to, first of all, the person will fear when you just say online learning, the person sees it as something which is very impossible. So uh, there was a, a, a group of students that was given to me. I was lecturing them. These are uh, teachers already who are in the field. They came for upgrading. So when the university asked us to do online training, I was asking them to go to the ICT and get the university email so that I can reach out to them and we have our lectures. These children, sorry, these students refused completely. They, are, they all had smartphones. But their issue was that we, for us, we don't know. For us, we don't know, we don't know, we can't do that. I tried taking them through, but still there are those who were really, really reserved. They couldn't do anything. So in the first place, if government does not train our teachers with computer, yes, teachers go for training, but computer training has become something which is very necessary. And even the students themselves, when students come um, and they don't have that basic knowledge of computer, honestly, they fear. They fear. They think it is something very hard to do online training. Uh, when they have this, some will try. They will try to do uh, online. They will accept e-learning. Uh, cases of uh, strike on at campus because of e-learning would not be this much. So online training can only be effective um, one of the ways is by training that both the teachers and even the learners by giving them basic knowledge of computer. They should know them. Meanwhile, other issues of data, um, phones, smartphones, and so on are going to be there. But at least if you are, if these people are confident that they should, uh, that this online training is not a big deal, they are able to. Some can attempt to uh, learn. Indeed, this online training, I want to confess that is not effective. I happen to have over 500 students in my class. When we started the online uh, training, you'll only see around 40, 50 students attending. Hmm? This is actually no learning. So this is a very big problem. If government can do this and have this special program for both teachers and students, then online training will improve somehow. Thank you, Mr. Tokon. I submit. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lillian. Like I said, I want uh, to go to Okware, to go to Edith, and to go to Andrew. We are now having a very powerful discussion in the chat room. So um, let, let's begin with Peter. Peter, you see the bad with the rural children in Uganda. And COVID-19, as you're looking at the subject, you have under microscope. I've made, I've made things rather more complicated. Uh, Andrew also has the point. We have seen very many children moving from these rural schools, and they, they make something of their lives. I'm going to ask that first you first your microphone. Yeah, we've seen very many children getting out of these rural schools and becoming very, very big names in this country and conquering the world and doing amazing things. I'm not saying that that is how learning should be, that you should pass through hard conditions and then become someone great. But I'm just saying that given the resource envelope of our government, given uh, everything bad that is going on in this country, I mean, we need to put money in security, we need to put money in agriculture, there is a lot of investment that the government needs to do. Don't you think that um, under the current circumstances, with the little it has, the government has done enough for the education and what it is doing is enough. What, 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 what would be your take on this? Godwin, okay, thank you. Uh, firstly, I would like to, to, to tell uh, all the, the panelists and the viewers that uh, I'm one person who has done all what it takes to promote this government. I promote it internally and externally. And uh, I've been invited on so many forums, basically about education, but at the end of the day, the maths don't go to teacher Peter. I give all the credit firstly to God and to the government, simply because I'm also a beneficiary from UPE. But at the end of the day, uh, there are, the, if, if at least we are to move from one state to another, we should always at least try to be very realistic. Eh? I'm not saying that the government, like the way how Andrew is saying that I'm blaming, no. I'm one person who, the, and this is it. I can talk like this when you're on this forum, but when you are before the public or 
before teachers. I can't talk like this. But here I believe we are sharing information that at least can make situations better or the situation better. So this is it. Uh, if you look at the priority, uh, our government hasn't given education uh, the, at least that needed priority in terms of funding and even in terms of support through and through. So uh, the challenge with, well, the challenge is, I'm very sorry for the back background noise. Uh, very, very sorry, kindly forgive me. But the challenge is uh, our priorities are in other places, not in education per se simply because you like we have been talked about it at times uh you cannot feel the pain if you don't carry the wound and this is it there's a saying which is good which goes like this ubuntu uh, the spirit of togetherness and uh this is how i define ubuntu the wound of one should be the wound of all now if i personally i'm a i'm a person who studied from the rural school Toro prison primary school you might be knowing it it's in Toro deep there near the prison but i repeated thrice thrice and I saw many of my colleagues repeating, and most of them who repeated, uh, most of them could uh, just drop along the way. And simply because we had a supportive mother, I kept on going. But up to this time, if at least we were serious about saying what is our major challenge, and uh, we work upon that, at least by now we would be very far. But the truth is, the only challenge which we have in this nation is not, I wouldn't put it even on the government, I would put it on individuals even who make up the government, because at the end of the day, I don't know who is the government. Neither do you know who is the government, but the individuals who are, who are in all the state, who are in all the ministries, in one or the other. We find that uh, one, one, one thing which is killing us is policy. Everything is policy, 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 people are meeting here, meeting there. But at the end of the day, do we match the policy to the realities on the ground? So do we have the will to change? And uh, this one, there's a saying that um, there's a saying that Albert Einstein said. He said, "What is what is not popular always? What is not right is always popular, and what is popular, what is right is always unpopular." Now, the truth is, unless simply we are, we are sorry, <laughs> tell those people to go off the gate. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we are in a capitalistic state. But if I was a leader. And if anyone of us here becomes a leader, this would be my policy as a leader. I would at least try to work very hard to see that whoever claims to be serving the, the, the populace or the, 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 the generation or the state, their children should be in public schools, for heaven's sake. One factor. There they will feel the pain. They should be taking their children to public hospitals. And if I'm a, a minister, I assume I'm a, an MP in, let me say, Tororo, my child should be in a Pokol or Tororo prison primary school because it's a government school. At the end of the day, the, the people don't even understand the, the meaning of the word minister. Minister simply means you are ministering, you are serving people. How can we serve people when you are studying in the first class schools, yet others are studying in the, last, in the laughing stock schools, and at the end of the day, we just talk about it Yes, let me give you a last scenario. Um, in 2019, we did a pilot project with KCCA at uh, uh, one of the schools in Kampala here, it's called Nativo Settlement. This is a school which was struggling with getting first grades, but we found out it is in Kampala. But their challenge was teachers, their uh, competence was very low, and their uh, children, most of the children couldn't read, neither could they read any basic word of three letters. And when we, we made that pilot project, by the end of the day, by the end of the day, children could read after like three months. We put we, we did all what it took, and it was a voluntary program. Casey said didn't fund us, neither did the government put any sense in us. But that was their first year of starting getting first grade. So I don't know who loves the nation better. The one who talks about making things better, or us who do the things on ground. As we go in the villages and try to see that at least children are living, at, they are getting the quality education. So uh, the government should fund, put more funding in education. The government should invest a lot in teachers. Our teachers are very disgruntled. That is the reality. Most of them retire to poverty. And uh, if it comes to ICT, we are not yet there. We are not yet there simply because you don't have the basic necessities, which is electricity. 
so many people don't have solar. So if we had electricity and people had the gadgets, we could at least reach somewhere or be somewhere. But the more we end putting butter on bread, the more we end putting butter on the bread, I think we, we are doing a disservice to our nation. So at times we are all lovers of the government, but we should be realistic because it is only in education where we shouldn't put a lot of pretense because at, at the end of the day, this is the, the challenge. I'm sorry for taking so many minutes, but this is a challenge. The moment we put pretense, we are going to get quack doctors. They will teach you, they will treat your children, they will treat my children simply because they went through the poor policies and poor systems. You know the outcomes. We are going to get quack uh, civil servants, and everything will totally be a mess. So, in education, we shouldn't politicize, we shouldn't pretend, and we shouldn't talk as if things are fine when things are not fine. But we are not in the worst situation yet. Unfortunately, we are not where we should be. So we can do better. We can do better. That's at least my 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 my, my parting shot. Uh, we can do better. We can do better. Edith, um, I want to ask you as well. You've you've been part of that discussion in the chat room. 30, 37 years the NRIM and um, the education as we have it now. Do you think if the NRIM looks back? at um, its education record as a government. Do you think it is one that they are going to look at with regret um, for failures? Or you think, like Andrew is saying, well, they, they, there's nothing much they could have done. They, they have at least done. Is that your view or the previous is you? Thank you. Kindly repeat your question. I think I missed you due to the network. OK, I simply said that um, the, the government the current government has been in power for about 37 years. That's the NRM government. When you look at its education record, the divide you're talking about today, there's so many things that have gone seemingly amiss with education. Do you think if it looked at its own record, or if you were in their shoes and looked at that record, it's one you'd be, would it be one, is it one you'd be proud of, or it's one that you think um, should be taken with the wind, one that is, is not worth writing home about? Well, thank you very much, Godwin. Now, I... I do not like, you know, look, I do not always like uh, looking at the, the negative part of, you know, of someone or something. We must credit this government because as they came in, uh, Uganda's education sector was very terrible. They had just got out of the war. And if you look at history, if your parents have talked to you, it was hard to get in school. It was a miracle for any of our parents to actually complete education in the 1970s, 1960s. Uh, it only took a very strong support system of parents and communities. And uh, by then the government wasn't involved. And as I grew up in my own community, I saw government officials chase after parents, take, take men to prison if they're not able to take these children to, to school. I saw that happen and uh, I was very proud of this government, but it comes to this era, I think maybe because they have overstayed, I don't know, mm -hmm. the truth is well, they've made the education system better, but right Andy? now, when you bring in, you see Godwin, like if you start up, like let us say you've started something right. and it is helping out individuals. And then when it comes to the middle where you're supposed to even make it better so that it is useful for every individual. Then you Nanda, just a second. Nanda, please mute your microphone. Nanda, mute your microphone. Okay, let's. Thank you very much. Now, the problem is, and I was actually telling Andrew in the chat room, let us not hang on to our past. The war happened, it happened. It's been 40 years plus. What can we do for this country? What Now we have so many people. We should actually be thankful that now Ugandans want their children educated. They want a better country. So what can be done now? Eh? Why should we hold on? Oh, that education was disrupted by war. Every sector was disrupted by war. But ask yourself, later, dear panelists, why are other sectors 
funded? Why are they funded uh, better? You know, why are they funded well compared to the education sector? As the government, look at the private sector. It has been doing well when it comes to education. The schools are there, children, the, 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 the food systems are okay in their schools, uh, the, the discipline is okay. But when it comes to government, you just should be selfish. I feel like they should have been, if they should, they, you know, they have not supported schools, you know, complaining the government, you're not supporting us. How about their own schools that they started for communities? Eh? What have they done about it? How are their food systems? What, what do they do? Children feed on cold food that parents pack for them, you know? So I, I, much as, you know, yes, we appreciate and we acknowledge that the government did something. I mean, back where girls would not go to school, now we have girls going to school. But should, it, should we now have the poorest system should do descend because we have to hold on to our fair government of Uganda should try to make sure they are doing better. And when you look at, we didn't have expose, uh, we didn't have exposure like uh, in the because, uh, to Corona, we didn't know what was supposed to do. But we go to the first lockdown. You know, it takes in with the government. They should have done something like, you know, prepped something for the next phase of coronavirus. This is how we're going to have children who cannot go to school. I have a son who is now four years old. He's very tall. Now I'm afraid. He's, he, you know, schools closed before he could even start a kinder, you know, kindergarten. Is this now I might afford to even do for him online classes. How about other parents in rural areas? So I don't think, you know, Honestly, I, I want to appreciate the, the government as it came from. They have done better than where the education was in the 1960s, 1970s. But let them note the system. I don't know if they should, and they must do something. Okay. Uh Thank you. I want to bring in Nanda on that. So Nanda, um, what's your take on the subject under discussion? Do you think the government has done enough? Do you think there's more the government could have done that hasn't done? Or do you think the government is just not the one that can best handle education under the current circumstances? I can't seem to hear you speak, Nanda. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Good. So I, I was, uh, my point is this. I think someone somehow touched it, but I have rough figures, but our per capita spending, per capita spending means dividing our national budget with the population. Our per capita spending is about $600, even much lesser than that. No, it's not $600, but it's about 600,000 shillings. I think someone can convert that into dollars. So someone, I think, made this point some time back that we have less. So I think we need to judge government based on how much we have. Or you can, well, you can blame it for not having the capacity to grow our economy so that it increases its revenue base. But based on what government has, based on our poverty, you can be kind to them in what they've done. But of course, we cannot rule out prioritization. So this government has seemed, if you look at its distribution of the, of the national cake, it has seemed to prefer investing into the military, defense budgets, uh, investing into infrastructure, constructing roads and stuff and stuff. But I think this is a very uninformed investment because you, you're going to construct all the roads, you're going to supply all the electricity, but in the end, if the quality of your people has not improved and the quality of your people is to be improved through education, if it's not improved, you're not going to get back this money. And first of all, they are losing it to multinational capital. They are employing foreign companies to do this work where they invest, invest most. It will not come back, the money we've sunk into infrastructure, which is a wise investment, but 
if you ignore other investments like education, you lose that future. First, foreigners have taken that money and your population has not been capacitated to be able to eat into your infrastructure investment so that they can benefit. So I think that is a minus for government. We appreciate, we have a very narrow budget. Our per capita spending is low. You cannot spend 600,000 on someone a year. This is money people eat over the weekend at Acacia, these high places. So as a nation, we are poor. We accept that, we can understand. But government at least has to recalibrate some of its policies so that they encompass a, a, a general growth of different sectors of the economy. Don't concentrate on, only on the military because Uganda is not facing challenges of wars now and again. Most of, I think most of our defense budget is to secure other countries abroad. So we can posture that we have a very powerful military, but as long as people hear the discontent grows, it will come to a ceiling and it will explode. So I think government, with the little we have, fine, prioritize infrastructure, though I believe they should prioritize it while looking at domestic investment too. Good. Prioritize our security, fine, but make sure that education receives a bigger part of that budget. And quality education, because what happens, Museven simply speaks numbers. And that's what is good at. He rolls out kids into school. He doesn't care what happens after that. He does not talk about what quality of people he's pushing out. He only gives statistics of how many people he has sent into schools. You can construct all the classrooms, send their kids, but that's not education. If the quality of education is not ensured within those rooms, the material you're sending out is rubbish. I think I've seen it when I was interning sometime back at courts. The, for ex, this LDC court here, they have an entire building, well furnished, it looks nice, like it has everything, but it doesn't work. So you find people squeezed in one part of, one part of the court. And I was asking the registrar, why is this happening? And they told me, we do not have, government cannot pay for lawyers to, to be here. So you cannot argue that we have so many courtrooms, therefore we have justice, because justice is not those courtrooms. So meanwhile, I mean, in the same, in the same case, government cannot argue that we have so many schools, we have so many children entering schools and moving out of them. That's not education, this kind of, of education that UPE provides. So government needs to be more deliberate about what quality, what kids learn, so that we bridge up this gap. Otherwise, the way it's going now, it's a total mess. I don't know if I have another minute to conclude. Godwin, can I go on for, a, for about 30 seconds? Yeah, you can go on for a whole minute. Fine. So my mom is a, is a UPE teacher. She's, she heads the UPE schools as a headmistress. <laughs> but she fights so hard or she fought so hard that I never go through her hands. So. If UPE teachers don't trust their schools with their children, what does that say about whatever they are doing there? And I, I, I hear her conversations when results come out. When she calls fellow teachers, their question is this, was to deba maker? That means how many people failed? Like, all they care about is, I hope I don't, I don't have so many repeaters. They don't care about how, how good did I perform? Like, what, how many first grades did I have? How many this did I have? Their worry is about how many didn't make it. So it shows you that in their psych, in their small circles of teachers and staff in UPE, all they care about is to see that seven receives numbers of, we passed this number of students, but never it. So their worry is about, about what, not what quality of those that we teach, we push out. How qualified are they? Do they, can they write a letter? Can they speak good English? Can, do they have basic knowledge of what we teach? They don't care about that. So I think, in summary, I think government has less, but that less has not been optimally employed. So it is to blame somehow. We understand if we do not have, uh, the quality of education of the USA, we are not asking to be like USA or Canada or Brazil, but we are asking that we can have the quality of 
of what we hear in Rwanda that an economy can be poor, but government can be deliberate about having some quality education in its institutions that you can create a chuba where fine we do not have the per capita spending or even the per capita income of the United States or Sweden, but we can afford to send them uh, medical aid because we were very deliberate about training and making sure that the medics we train are good with the little resources we have, we are deliberate about that. So you get a, a hurricane like Hurricane Katrina in the US, Chuba can send you aid, even if it's a very poor economy. So we can't keep blaming our poverty, even if it's understandable. I think I'll end there, Godwin. Thank you. Andrew, we turn to you. Nanda says, we don't, need the, we don't want the quality of education in the US, but we want the best that we can have in our circumstances like Chuba. Uh, Edith said, we should stop blaming the war. That's long in the past. It's time now to act and, and we should utilize it. And um, um, on this part, Peter Liga did similar things. He says that we are not investing as much in education as we should do, and that's a shame that we need to really invest in education and make it better for everyone. I want to hear your rejoinder to this. Do you agree with what they're saying? The government investing less, is there need to invest more in education and all that they've said. When you look at it from your own perspective, they give you the divide we have in the education sector, for instance. So how does government invest more for the rural, uh, rural poor people? Um, thank you, Godwin. Um, hmm. Education. How sectors for education. We are here talking about e-learning, right? Currently, internet access in Uganda is at 52%, with 21 million people using the internet. High-speed fiber optical cables cover 3,900 kilometers. That is an investment that supports education. Uh, I can't seem to hear Andrew. Uh, looks like we've lost him. So I'm going to start with Lillian. Um, um, then we move to Edith. So I want to get concluding remarks from each of you. Uh, the discussion we've had today. So how, what should the government do? How should they improve uh, the education sector going forward? I mean, I said Lillian, I meant Irene. So let's start with Irene. Uh, your concluding remarks. If you became the mini, uh, a presidential advisor on education today, what would you advise the president to do. So let's start from there and move on. Thank you, Mr. Toko. One key thing I would advise the president to do is to motivate teachers. There can't be quality education when teachers are not motivated. In government schools, uh, teachers, these teachers, both from government schools and who are working in private schools, they go, uh, they undergo the same training. Why is it that in private schools, uh, people are uh, pupils or students Godwin. are performing well? Meanwhile, in government schools, they are not performing well. Teachers in government schools, they now work, they are not full time at all, much as their appointment is reading full time. They have to go somewhere riding border borders just to. Hello, to go ahead. Go ahead just to add on the money that they are getting, some have their farms, they want to make ends to meet. So motivation of teachers is a key thing that I'm, I'm, I'm requesting the government to do. 
if government can do that, teachers will also be self-motivated to work hard to make sure that these children work. And then facilities. You can see a government school opening without a library. I happened to go to one of the schools. There was a government school that was open, but no single book was there on ground. For, for teachers to use. Now you have a little salary, you have to use part of your salary for buying data for research, you have to use part of your salary for buying books and so on. Many teachers relied on their, uh, on their own notes which they came with from the colleges, which might not even be relevant to the curriculum of these students. So motivation of the teachers and then government should look up to the facilities in the schools to make sure that the basic things like library, they should really be updated. Because if this is not done, nothing. There will never be quality education in government schools. Government always puts uh, enhance, enhancement of salaries. There was a year uh, uh, on papers and everywhere, it was read that teacher salaries are going to be increased, the scientists and so on and so forth. When the financial year came, I saw uh, the police sector, the what what, they were improved, but the one of teachers was not. This is something which is very big. Motivation of teachers is what I'm requesting government to do. And if this is done, quality of education is going to improve. Thank you. Toko, I submit, I want to thank CCG. I thank everyone, all my colleagues who are here. May God bless you all. Thank you very much. Andrew is back, but uh, Andrew, make your submission and then give us your concluding remarks uh, so that we can move to the panelists. Thank you, Godwin. Um, I was saying, um, Every time government invests in any other sector, defense, roads, education sector, COVID-19 has taught us um, our, understand, our understanding of IT and how we can relate it to education. And I'm glad because the Ministry of Education in their latest statement uh, are talking about teaching of science, mathematics, and technology education at all levels for teachers and students. With a 52% penetration of internet, this is a good one who, um, who says the president only follows statistics. Statistics describe and they show um, the success or the challenges that we are facing. So you must throw them out. It's very unfortunate um, that your mother does not trust in the institution in which she's leading. She should be the first point of change in that institution. So it's very unfortunate that she does not do that. And, and honestly, I, I really wish she would now be play her civic and patriotic duty and, be, and begin to do that. Uh, because she's, she's, she, she's in charge of citizens of Uganda, students of Uganda. They deserve good education. So she must give it challenges notwithstanding. Um, my concluding remarks would be that uh, COVID-19 has, has changed the entire world. It has changed all sectors everywhere. It, the challenges that we're going through are not unique to Uganda. Everybody is struggling to adopt, to change, and, and, you know, and, 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 and uh, to change the way they are doing things. So Uganda, Uganda is not unique in that sense. Um, so it, it, this would require all of, all of us, um, policymakers, stakeholders, parents, students, it would require all of us to, to, to understand this new reality and to find our space and find a way of contributing, especially within the education. Rural areas are hard hit. It's, it's unfortunate, it is true, they are hard hit, but so are urban areas. Government, I believe, is doing its level best. I know in some areas it can do better, but as far as education is concerned, government is doing its level best to address these challenges. Yesterday, there was a full spread in the new vision talking about how Ministry of Education is working towards um, uh, reopening schools under, with, under certain conditions, how it is working towards developing local schools so that it can stay 
if you stay in the capability, you do not have to drive, drive all the way to carbon, such so trends that are happening. I don't understand that we understand them, appreciate them, and play our role and give government the support that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bessie Andrew. Andrew. Uh, let's listen in now from Edith, and then we shall move to Nanda. Thank you very much, Bedouin. Um, I would like to say that, uh, like I said earlier, let the government be more involved in its own schools, government owned schools. Like Irene said, let them start with motivating their teachers. But right now, you know, that, cannot, that is not needed right now in the pandemic. What is needed is these children able to access learning materials so that they can get back in the game of studying. You know, there is something, you know, you can provide these learning materials. It must not be through internet. The many sectors within the Ministry of Education can do something to make sure that all these rural schools, all these areas in primitive, all these schools in primitive areas had to reach areas of moving that can move up, that, you know, schools that are deep inside there. Let them, let the government reach out to them, let the children, people, especially primary schools, let them, you know, let them be able to do it to access learning materials, uh, you know, and so that they keep in the game. That is their mindset still, you know, get, you know, their mindset kept on the fact that they are still going to go to school. And then you let the government invest in education. We are, without education, a country is nothing. So much as we have already received that education, let us not forget that there are generations of uh, and generations and generations of Ugandans that actually need this basic education and need quality education. So the government must be that line and look at empowering teachers and look at, you know, and you know, Andrew's talking about infrastructure development. What does this mean? We have so many schools that are well built, but the quality of education in there is very poor. They actually, like in the private schools, they don't even have uh, students with the quality of education who are there. So let us look at the quality of education that Ugandans need at our level. We are a developing country and we understand that. And uh, and then, Andrew, please take a message to the government of Uganda. Stop blaming the past for the mistakes that individuals are making right now. Yes, we had war. How about if we look at you, Rwanda, that has a that had the whole genocide? People were murdered. Everything they started up. How about countries that like Libya? How about countries? You know, how about countries that are always having wars, but they try to what? You know, they try to make sure that they, they you know they are patriotic towards their country and try to look out for each and every citizen of their country. So I would like the government, let something be done with education. Imagine if Corona is like this, what is going to happen? Uh, we're going to have a high rate of teenage mothers. Are we going to have a high rate of school dropouts, increased number of street kids? You know, let us look at empowering our educa education sector, empower the schools, empower the teachers, so that we avoid future and enhance Thank you very much. Thank you, CCD, for having us. Thank you, Edith. Uh, Nanda, your concluding remarks, and we we'll move on, finishing the query. Yes, Godwin. This, uh, today's talk has had an element of talking about inequality and COVID-19. So I think the first thing government of Uganda should look at is <clears throat> how are they going to bridge to bridge the gap of inequality that has been exacerbated by COVID-19? We are going to, there are already statistics out about how many girls have dropped out of school because they are pregnant. So many child families have started up, children are parenting. Uh, so many people have been pushed uh, below their economic standing prior COVID. So they are broke. So the first question even should be, 
Am I had Godwin? Yes, you are. Godwin, am I? Oh, good. So the first question should be, is government even making an effort to have statistics and to know each of these uh, scenarios? Does it know how many pregnant mothers we have? Does it know how many children have joined into child labor? Because these will not go back to, to school if they started making some little money. So it has... It has to be very deliberate about this and know this is the kind of society we are dealing with. These are the numbers. So after that, they need to design policies that are going to say schools must accept these pregnant girls back. They must have a policy that says, how are we going to allow, I'm being bothered by that person who is unmuting. They need... They need to have a policy that says this is the number of children that have started families, but we need to make sure that they get back into schools. And once they are back into schools, government has had a recovery plan for different sectors of the economy. They've been bankrolling uh, small scale businesses. Just a minute. Irene, please mute. Irene, mute your microphone. Nanda, proceed. Yes, government has been deliberate about bankrolling different industries, making sure they get back to their feet. So we need some kind of Nabanja intervention in education. The comments that the Minister of, of Finance made about schools and administrators that they should sell off their properties and stuff were very unwelcome. Wealthy nations print money when it comes to the worst, like in the 2008 economic crisis, they print money to save the economy. So you cannot just tell people that sell off, because selling off property in economics is called the leveraging. You come to a scenario where you've refused to, to cushion education institutions, so you will tell them sell off their property. But in a deleveraging, property has lost value, so I will want to sell a school, but if I'm selling a school because schools are not working, who, who, who is the stupid investor to buy it? I, the bank will take it and will have nothing to do with it. So problem not solved. If a, if a bank takes back a property that is not going to be invested in, it makes no sense. You're back to zero. So government needs to know how in the recovery plan, they are going to make sure that schools have a footing where to start because they've, they've been ditched. <clears throat> then... People have talked about uh, uh, motivating teachers, but I think we should also look at ensuring that the teachers are qualified. Government is trying to grade out, I don't know if it's grade two teachers or something, but they are trying to upgrade so that we have qualified teachers teaching our students, our children. So government needs to, in the past we had inspectors. I started school in UPE schools and you had a small motorcycle that you would see in the road and the entire school changes. The teachers panic, the head teacher panics. If he's been in the garden, he's cold, he comes back rushing because the inspectors come. Government didn't have, we were not as wealthy, we were very poor. 2007, 2006, we are now a bit wealthy as a country. But government was very deliberate about what goes on in its UPE schools. So we need this back. Do we know whether teachers are teaching? Are they receiving their salaries? These things are very small, but they, are, they build up and improve in the long run. This is how economies improve. So I think that's what I, I, I would advise that government does. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's hear the last conclusion from Okware and we call it a discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, all the panelists for the good knowledge shared. Uh, kindly let us not leave this knowledge here. Just try to see that at least we take it to the next level of implementation. I think implementation is one of the, our challenges again as a nation. We can talk and talk, oh, but implementing things. Oh. So um, I believe um, to start with, uh, I believe this was the best opportunity. It was a golden opportunity that we have lost as a nation. 
it was the best opportunity for us to redesign and uh, restructure our education as Uganda by at least trying to see ways on how we can make things better. Uh, if you look at what we are still studying, uh, we are still studying what your father studied, I think Godwin, and even Andrew himself here and all the panelists. What your father answered is what you are still answering, what your children are answering, and even what your children, children will answer, that is very dangerous, very dangerous. And people who know that it is dangerous, for them, their children are not answering what we are answering. That's why they decide to take their children outside Uganda so that they can answer the, uh, the better questions of the 21st century as we are still answering the questions, not even of the 19th, but of the 17th century, which is very unfortunate. So it's an opportunity that we have lost as a nation. And at least if we had used it better, it would have put us at a very better standing with the rest of the world in terms of uh, provision of equitable and quality education. But to start with again, uh, do we have the will? Do we have the will, that national will of seeing that you want each person to become informed? And uh, I think these ones are, are questions that I'm not going to answer, that I would like each member to answer. And all uh, the viewers, the first one is, what is education? Yes, and uh, at least uh, based on the COVID, has it at least enabled us to answer, to find the clear answer on that? And what are the types of the education? And who are they? what are the centers of learning? So uh, this time when everyone was home, at least it would be the right time for us to, to use it better in terms of instead of grappling with the ICT online learning, but it was the right time for, for, for I wouldn't even could say the government, but all the stakeholders, be the media, to empower, to empower the populace, to see that at least each person can get to know their role in the education or in the learning of our, in the, in, in, in the way how we, 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 we should strategize and structure the learning. Then uh, I have a question that at least each one at least will have to, to look for an, an answer. And this was part of my presentation during the Mandela Washington Fellowship. Uh, it was the education we need versus the education we want. If as a nation you have not yet decided, what should we promote as a nation? Are we promoting the education we need or the education we want? And do we know what it means? Or it's just about talking about ICT, ICT. Anyway, I think, uh, sorry for, uh, Andrew, you're not uh, against, you need your opinion, but uh, Andrew, you talked about uh, ICT, but the truth is your network was extremely poor, very poor. Assume you are now in a lesson, teaching, or you are learning, and you are the teacher conducting the lesson. There you would have lost everyone. But at the same time, when you are telling us how the government has, has got this optic fiber, this and that and that, those are statistics. I'm staying in Kampala, but I struggle with the network. Currently, I'm using, uh, I think you're saying what I'm using. I'm using uh, MyFi, but I struggle with the network. What about the person who can't even afford a MyFi? How, how are they? So at the end of the day, there are the roles that are should, should be done by the individuals or the people. And one of it is at least getting those gadgets. We don't know whether we have the money or the people have the money. But there are also the must to do by the government. And the must to do is basically the essential that people can't invest in. Firstly, subsidizing on the cost of the data. Secondly, investing in all our teacher colleges to see that teachers get the ICT skills and the knowledge. Thirdly, having you as a government, I don't know that you have even any media whereby at least teachers are trying, uh, teachers and the nation is being educated. It is all and uh, the well wishers who are doing what it takes to see that we break that gap. Then um, finally, this is a challenge again with all of us. I think it is one thing that we should make, a, 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 it should be a topic or a subject in all our schools. Uh, whenever there are discussions, these are very, uh, and uh, I've seen it from the opposition, I've seen it from the government, I've seen it from even the world wishers, and I've seen it from all people. This is a big challenge that we should work on. Whenever the, the discussions are going on, there are three types of people, three. The first people are people who listen to respond, just to respond. And there are people who listen to learn, that is the second category. And the third category of people, there are people who listen to defend. So this is a challenge in our nation. Whenever, if I'm talking for the government, I will always talk while defending, however bad things might be. 
If I'm talking from the opposition, I'll talk while defending, however, my, however bad or negative it might be. So if we are to change the nation, that's not the way how things should be done. And at the end of the day, any nation that thrives and uh, becomes successful, it starts by investing a lot in human resource. So that is why, why I talked about not being very statistical, but we should be realistic. I'm one person, by the way, I'm sorry, not blowing my own trumpet, but at least I've had a better uh, inter interface with so many, so many learners and so many teachers. And uh, at times I do it voluntarily without even any intervention that this one has given me money or the other one. But the truth is if you go on ground and uh, what we are talking about basically of ICT and the online learning, uh, people don't know even how to use Google. I've seen teachers who don't even know how to use Google to navigate, to find the information. And then when you tell up, when you, when you call people and tell them uh, there's this information person will ask you, is it on Facebook? Is it here or there? And that's why for us, like under teachers I mean, we started an initiative called the Lockdown Homework. And in this Lockdown Homework, we have been distributing homework to, to parents and teachers through our social media platform, basically Facebook yeah, and uh, WhatsApp. But uh, we have so far reached over 400 and, four, four, uh, let me see the, the data here, 413,000. 413,000 parents plus in the space of this, just this lockdown. But one time we got a call from a parent from, uh, from I think, was it from um, uh, Karamoja there? The person said, ah, teacher, thank you for the work that you put for us, but kind of these days you are spent two days minus putting work. Whenever you want to put work, the entire community doesn't learn. And we didn't even have that in mind that there are people as far as Karamoja who might be getting the work. But when you hear on TV, People say that people get work. Personally, I, it might be true, but how are they getting it, the one that the government is supplying? Then finally, if I come on the issue of the teachers, um, look at it, uh, and I think this is a question to all of us. How many children or how many people from the world to do family end up becoming teachers? That's a very big question that we should all ask ourselves. If you look at it, teaching is one of the last resort profession but teaching the next generation. It's a danger, it's an, and it's a very big danger that at least, if we, whether you want it, whether you are the president, whether you are the chairperson, whether you are a parent, whether you are teacher, Peter, whether you are who, if we don't first design methodologies on how to support education from the foundation, there's a, at the end of the day, we are going to blame that the whites don't love us. We are going to, to fight each other. We are going to blame people that they are opposing our governments and opposing our, our systems, but when we don't know what is the root cause. But look at it. Go and Andrew and any person, Lillian, go and make your own even Godwin. You got 10 teachers in your community. Just 10, don't look for 30. Ask those 10, who among you is just entered into, into teaching out of passion? And who is passionate about the teaching? You'll find that those ones who are in it out of passion, they are in it by the grace of God. But people are totally not happy for one factor that they have been neglected. And on TV, what people talk is not what they do. So uh, we should be realistic, not statistical. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Okware. Uh, that was a long one. Thank you very much, dear esteemed viewers of Safe Space TV. This has been the seventh edition of our community show webinar. And we are always happy that you tune in and listen to these wonderful panelists to bring, share their ideas. Uh, like I always say, there are other discussions that happen and they are also broadcast on this very channel. The latest of which now is the university, the, the, the university students debate. Um, and the, the first episode is going to be put up very soon. So whenever you get the chance, look up for these things and watch them as well. From us here, at uh, CCG and C Space TV, thank you very much for tuning in. We do request that you subscribe to this channel so that you get notified and turn on your notifications so that you get notified whenever there are new videos of this kind. Uh, thank you very much. Have a great day and see you next week.